So, good day everyone. I'm Sasi, the medical liaison for heart failure from Novartis. And before we begin, just a few quick reminders. So hygiene is key to staying healthy, so please pay, play your part. So wear a face mask, wash your hands frequently with soap and water, and also sanitize uh, regularly. And also do try to keep a two meter, meter distance from each other at all times. And the hand sanitizers and face masks are actually available at the front reception. And the food is av available at the foyer. Also, please switch off your mobile phone to silent mode and the parking fee is RM15 flat rate per entry. The surau is also located at level 3 next to the washroom. And furthermore, we really want to hear your feedback so that we may improve our future programs. So please use the QR code below to fill out the feedback form. And in addition, to request for an e-certificate, please provide us your name as per IC and also email address before you click Submit to complete the overall online survey. Okay, with that, I would like to now welcome everyone to our first physical event since the MCO, the CVA Scale Primary Care Summit. We truly appreciate everyone who took the time out of their busy schedule to actually attend um, our event, right, like, which is happening today. And today we are joined by esteemed speakers, Dr. David and Dr. Lawrence, and also the chair for today's session, Dr. Ture Singham. Dr. Ture Singham graduated with MBBS from St. Thomas Hospital Medical School, London, and, attended, uh, and attained his MRCP UK in 1988. He was then awarded the FRCP of London in 2002. He has vast experience in all major areas of international cardiology and has published multiple papers in international journals. And without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ture Singham to chair today's session. Dr. Ture Singham. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of CVSKL, I'd like to thank Novartis and Docrity for hosting really unusual gathering here at the Majestic Hotel. Now, I've been here several occasions before to this great room. It's always been for a wedding. And now I feel like I'm invigilating an exam, looking down at all of you spaced so sparsely across this place. But anyway, it's very uh, fortunate that we're actually able to meet in the flesh in the same place. So this afternoon, I hope it'll be punchy uh, and uh, something that'll grab your attention and hopefully leave, help you leave here with some better understanding about heart failure management in the general practice sphere. So um, there are people watching this at home, so I welcome everybody who is watching this remotely. And the first person I'd like to introduce this afternoon is, <coughs> sorry, uh, Dr. Lawrence Chan, my colleague, who's had a glittering career spanning from his days in Saramban as a kid, then going to University of Malaya, and then on to Australia, where he, he learned to become a cardiologist came back to UM and then went into the private practice. He was one of the biggest names in Subang Medical Center in the private uh, sphere. He's well respected by everyone across the country and has given many talks before as an expert general sound cardiologist in all areas. So I'd like to welcome, I'd like you all to welcome Lawrence to give his uh, case presentation. A lot of new things. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. And uh, uh, it's been a terrible uh, six months. Uh, we've been doing a lot of Zoom talks. It's just quite different. Uh, now you come, you have to spray everything. Uh, I'm more than six feet away, so I'll take off my mask. Uh, you can feel quite safe. 
Um, uh, today, I'd just like to talk, uh, talk about a case that I saw recently that reflects the kind of cases we see, uh, and um, uh, maybe we can talk around that. So, um, can I show my slides? Yeah. So, uh, this uh, patient uh, presented on the 8th of November last year, before we ever heard of uh, Wuhan or COVID-19. Uh, um, he is a 48-year-old male, uh, previously well, had an accident with some kidney injury uh, before, uh, smoked cigarettes. Uh, he's a very tall chap, uh, 175. His weight was about uh, 85 kilograms. Uh, doesn't take alcohol. His, uh, he came to see me because his father was my patient. Uh, his father had ischemic heart disease and diabetes and passed away when he was in his late 60s. So this chap gave a history of having had a severe cough and hemoptysis, and this started after traveling. Um, and uh, he was admitted to a hospital then, and he was treated uh, after he was found to have, uh, uh, after a CT scan showed that he had uh, what they called a sinus retention cyst. He improved with antibiotics, but he noticed that he was more breathless than he previously uh, had, uh, had been and that this was getting worse and worse, and he would intermittently go to different clinics each time, but with that history, he was always treated as uh, sinusitis. So one month before coming to see me on the 8th of November, his cough had, had recurred and had gotten worse. The cough was especially noticeable at night. There was no phlegm, no wheezing, and no fever. He also noticed that he was breathless on exertion, and at night, he had to sit up because uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the few weeks before coming to see me. Uh, there was no leg swelling, no exertional chest pain, no chest pain at all. He complained of bloatedness and uh, otherwise his weight was stable and his bowels were normal. On the day that he came to see me, when he walked in, he looked breathless. Uh, his, he was tachycardic. His heart rate was 116 beats per minute. His blood pressure was normal, 130 on 80. Uh, his JVP, jugular venous pressure, was not raised. Uh, he had a S3 gallop. It was a very obvious uh, third heart sound. Uh, and because he's tachycardic, he was tachycardic, so it, it was defined as a S3 gallop. His lungs were clear, and his oxygen saturation was 100% on room air, and he did not have any leg edema. So um, on clinical examination with his third heart sound and him being tachycardic, um, uh, it looked very much like heart failure at the time of admission. So we, uh, at the time when I saw him, so I uh, advised him to admit immediately. We did uh, 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 LBCS5 for us, it's a full blood screen, and I added the anti-pro BNP. Uh, we also did the routine ECG, X-ray and echo, and I said uh, plan him for a heart scan later on. Uh, so his blood results came back with his uh, creatinine was 116. Uh, his hemoglobin was normal, his thyroid function, liver function, all normal, and his, uh, his uh, A1C was normal, and his a LDL was 4.1. His anti-pro BNP came back as being uh, very high. Uh, so at 3,800, which is very high for a person of his age. So this is his ECG. Okay, this pointer doesn't work for this. Uh, it shows um, inferior Q waves and also uh, a Q wave in uh, V3 and possibly uh, V4 as well. So, oh, okay, not this one. So, in, inferior Q waves to so suggest a possible O inferior infarct and possible O anteroceptor infarct. And this is his chest x ray. Which button do you press? So uh, it's uh, obviously a very enlarged heart. Press C. C. Okay. The, um, the uh, cardio, uh, cardiac and thoracic ratio, uh, cardio, cardiac to thoracic ratio being well above 0 0.5. There's um, um, uh, perihyla um, um, uh, the vasculature is... Uh, uh, congested, uh, the upward uh, deviation of the um, vasculature as well, but no pleural effusions. So I then sent him for an echocardiogram, and this um, is what it shows. 
Oops, sorry. Let me go back. The basis would be here. The, they are contracting normally. But uh, you start to appreciate that uh, the left ventricle looks enlarged and the going towards the apex, it seems to be more um, hypokinetic. This is the view, the uh, parasternal short axis view, and the anterior wall is not contracting well. But the most obvious is in the four chamber view. <coughs> the uh, distal septum is thinned out, the apex is thinned out. It is not contracting as well as at the, um, as at the basis here. So uh, the technician felt that it was global, uh, but uh, it, when you look at it now, it looks regional. So it tends to imply ischemia as a cause <coughs> of his cardiomyopathy. When you look at his numbers, um, the left ventricle is very enlarged. Uh, it, the, you would expect this uh, left ventricle in, uh, in diastolic uh, uh, diameter to be about 55 or less. His is 7.4, so it's enlarged. His ejection fraction was calculated at only about 14%. So he has a very severe dilated cardiomyopathy. So we admitted him and uh, we put him, uh, put him in bed, asked him to rest, started restricting him, uh, restricting his fluid and his salt intake, uh, gave him diuretics, uh, frusimide, and started him on uh, spironolactone. And uh, we, I chose to start him directly on uh, uh, secubitral valsartan, which is entrestor, and later on, when he was a bit better, we started him on low-dose uh, beta blocker. So the, when he's, he stabilized and his creatinine actually improved, we then wanted to do a heart scan, but uh, we, I didn't proceed with it because the, vent, the vessels were very calcified. So uh, he definitely had uh, coronary artery disease and there was not much to be gained by doing an injection. So we said we'll go directly to invasive angiography. And unfortunately for him, it showed him to have severe triple vessel disease. Uh, and persuade him as I might, he absolutely said he will not have bypass. He said, no, nope, he's not having bypass. He said, there's a risk to bypass. He cannot take any risk. And I said, angioplasty may have similar risks, but he refused. Uh, uh, after, after about a few weeks of his refusal, then we agreed to, uh, with him to do stage angioplasty. So we had to do angioplasty with balloon pump support and under general anesthetic. So it was uh, very challenging. So um, this is his angiogram. Uh, I think this one was in uh, the last visit in, uh, sorry, his echo in, uh, um, in um, just recently, two weeks ago. The, um, it had improved somewhat, but the anterior wall is still down. And this is the view there. So perhaps there's greater, there's more movement there. And the ejection fraction now is calculated to be about 35 to 40%. So it's still quite poor. Um, but the interesting thing is his uh, anti-pro BNP levels. So when he first came in, it was, um, uh, that was uh, when he first came. And this is before his first angio, uh, angioplasty. This is just with medications. Uh, then this is, uh, this is before his second angioplasty, and this is his uh, most recent visit. Uh, clinically, he, has, uh, he feels better now, um, and he's had about uh, seven stents inserted, uh, and uh, he's now on a, a similar list as what I mentioned before. That means a beta blocker. He's on Entrestor. He's not on any, more, any diuretics. Uh, he's not on Frusimide. He's on Spironolactone alone. Now, uh, the, the, this case is to illustrate uh, heart failure. Uh, and um, how is it relevant to us? Well, firstly, it's going to be quite common. Uh, this study was done in February, I think about 10 years ago in GHKL uh, ER. About 7% of admissions are heart failure patients, of which 50% of these heart failure patients would have coronary artery disease as, uh, as a cause of their heart failure. Uh, unfortunately, heart failure still carries a very bad prognosis, uh, similar to lung cancer. Uh, 
but uh, so uh, but there's been a lot of improvements in uh, in medication so that's what we'll be uh, discussing today I pulled out the study from 2006 about the difference in uh, diagnosis and management uh, between cardiologists and family doctors but I only decided to, uh, for today to show one slide, which is um, what do we use as tools? And this is entirely, I think, what would apply to us here um, uh, in Kuala Lumpur as well, that uh, both uh, the family practice and in, uh, the, in the hospital, we will probably get an ECG done, we will get an X-ray done. But of course, very obviously, um, echo is going to be much easier in the hospital, but uh, uh, having said that, uh, if uh, somebody around here in KL wants an echo done, they can just send a patient, for example, to our hospital without necessarily referring to us. Uh, uh, 2D echo costs around $600. So an echo can be easily organized if the patient is in the area. So um, now with heart failure, of course, uh, what we will want to consider is about the how do we make the diagnosis. If you look at the clinical criteria for diagnosis, you need to have two major, uh, uh, two, two major or one major and two minor criteria, and this is the list. Uh, you don't need to commit this to memory, but uh, this is just to illustrate the point that diagnosing heart failure in patients presenting in, uh, in primary care is probably going to be difficult. Uh, unless they, are, they, they come as obvious as that guy when he came to my clinic, it was already one year into his disease. And so uh, his signs and sy symptoms were quite obvious then. But at the beginning of the disease, it might be difficult. So um, how can we improve our, um, our, uh, our, uh, our accuracy in diagnosing heart failure? Well, uh, when we see patients with heart failure, we probably do a full uh, blood screen, uh, we'll do a, a, a chest x-ray and ECG as we mentioned. A chest x-ray would be very helpful. But uh, what I wanted to concentrate on today is um, BNP levels, the natriuretic peptides. So um, what are they? Now, uh, the uh, natriuretic peptides were first, uh, they, are, uh, they are released when uh, there's a decline in systolic uh, function of the heart. So when a person starts to have heart failure, you have this activation of three major neurohormonal systems of which are quite familiar to us. It's a sympathetic nervous system, which is going to be uh, dysfunctional the renin angiotensin aldosterone system uh, is also going to be dysfunctional, but there's going to be a counter uh, a, a compensatory mechanism called the natriuretic peptide system, which if activated, is, it will try to vasodilate to reduce blood pressure, reduce sympathetic tone, and to uh, cause diuresis. So it is a compensatory uh, mechanism. So um, natriuretic peptides were first found in brain tissue. Therefore, the BNP, B stood for brain, to distinguish it from ANP, which was released from the atria. However, subsequently, the BNP was found to be primarily released by the left ventricle. Um, the pro-BNP is a precursor protein, which is continuously produced by the left ventricle. It is cleaved by an enzyme to release the active uh, hormone, which is BNP, and the inactive fragment, the anti-pro-BNP, which is what I would like to concentrate on today. Um, the more the left ventricle is stretched, the more the heart goes into heart failure, the higher the levels of BNP and anti-pro-BNP. Um, while we are at it, I'll just mention now that the new agent, Entrestor, sacobutyl, uh, affects the BNP metabolism. So, uh, BNP, BNP as a marker is a bit less uh, accurate as a measure of heart failure when a person is on Entrestor, whereas anti-pro-BNP is not affected and still can be used. So coming back to the natriuretic peptides, BNP and pro-BNP, these are diuretic, uh, they have diuretic and vasodilatory effects. 
uh, and it is uh, released to compensate for pressure overload of the left ventricle. Now, concentrations of this biomarker is increased, as I said, in heart failure, and, but it's also increased in structural heart disease, uh, such as valve disease, and also in atrial fibrillation. Uh, it is, uh, the levels tend to go up with age, particularly, but it's also slightly higher in women, and also when there is uh, renal dysfunction. Whereas, uh, if a person is obese or they have been treated with diuretics and beta blockers, the levels may, uh, may decrease somewhat. Um, the natriureptic peptides have shown to have proven value through several um, uh, studies, and I'm going to show them a bit later, because they are highly sensitive uh, uh, for heart failure. And best of all, they have a very good negative predictive value. In other words, let's say a patient turns up and they're breathless and we are, worried, we are not sure, is it heart failure, is it COPD? If the uh, level is low, maybe below the level of 280, it is quite unlikely that the patient has heart failure. So the negative predictive value is particularly good, but uh, it is also uh, very good to um, track patients' heart failure as well. Um, and the advantage of excluding heart failure is that you, if a person has a very low uh, anti-pro BNP level, then you uh, might be able to avoid sending the patient for echocardiography, which will cost, uh, cost more. Uh, the anti-pro BNP level if it, uh, in our hospital costs about 180 ringgit. So it's a very useful uh, test to be done. Uh, the uh, emergency departments use them very frequently to differentiate between uh, patients who might be a, a lung, uh, more a respiratory, uh, a person with more respiratory component to their breathlessness than, to, uh, than, than heart failure. So um, when appropriate cutoffs are used, and these uh, usually the cutoffs are staged according to age, so they will tier it according to age, then the uh, anti-pro BNP levels uh, have a very low risk of failing to exclude heart failure. So I just want to show a few, uh, few more slides. Uh, one is the uh, Paradigm Heart Failure Study showed uh, that increased anti-pro BNP levels were consistently associated with worse CV outcomes, uh, that uh, reduction of anti-pro BNP levels with treatment also showed a lower CV death or uh, risk of re-hospitalization. So uh, it can be used to track progress. And um, another study showed that uh, the cardiac structural changes parallel reductions in anti-pro-BNP levels and reduction in anti-pro-BNP levels parallel improvements in quality of life. So uh, anti-pro-BNP level result will come up somewhat like this, and this was the um, that, uh, patient, the case study's most recent result, and it will show uh, the results according to uh, age, uh, three age groups. Uh, so um, it will help us uh, track his progress. Finally, I just want to quickly mention cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI is advantageous because it has unlimited imaging windows, right? It, is, uh, it takes pictures in 3D. It doesn't have radiation. And because it takes pictures uh, in 3D and in an unlimited, uh, it can take unlimited images, uh, there is little uh, inter-observer variability. And it shows very good uh, tissue characterization, very good contrast between the endocardial border and the blood pool. Uh, so um, it, is, it takes away some of the um, variability that we see in echocardiography. In the long term, it might be something that uh, um, probably more in the hospitals that we will use to uh, assess patients' progress it helps us uh, see whether there is um, myocardial uh, ischemia, how much of myocardial viability is left, how much of scarring there is, but as a modality to track uh, patients' heart failure progress nowadays, it's still probably too early, especially given the costs. So um, with that, I just wanted to, I wanted to present to you
a heart failure case which was not easy to diagnose initially. It was the, the, the case was uh, skewed because of a very early diagnosis of sinusitis. Um, but uh, most importantly, I wanted to show that uh, anti-pro-BNP levels can be done. It is done very easily. The cost is in the range of below 200 ringgit. If you get a very low level, you can pretty much be sure that the patient does not have heart failure. Um, and uh, it, the test can also be used to track, uh, track patients progress as well. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence, for a very interesting case and a nice summary about the role of pro-BNP in the diagnosis and, and surveillance of patients with heart failure. Now, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker as well, Dr. Dr. David Chu. Uh, legend in heart failure in Malaysia and structural heart disease, one of the pioneer IGN cardiologists who we uh, were very lucky to woo to CVSKL. Um, he <coughs> has had a long history um, of having an interest in structural and um, not only ischemic heart disease. He's also interested in pulmonary hypertension and cardiomyopathies. So today he's going to uh, run through the optimization of heart failure management and uh, whether we're doing enough in this date, uh, time and place. David, please. Thank you, Suray. It's uh, nice to be seeing people when uh, you're giving a talk. I think in the last three, four months, uh, I've been asked to give a few talks on uh, webinars and just looking at the computer. So you don't know, don't know who is uh, listening to your talks most of the time. Um, so uh, the task that has been given to me is to talk about uh, heart failure management. And the question to ask is, uh, are we doing enough in the treating the patients? Let me start by talking about the classification of heart failure. Uh, we can divide heart failure into acute and chronic heart failure. Acute heart failure are patients who are acutely unwell with rapid onset of symptoms and often these patients require hospitalization. And we can have a heart failure that is in the chronic phase, usually when patients are more stable. We can also classify heart failure according to the left ventricular ejection fraction. When we measure the ejection fraction, normal ejection fraction is considered to be more than 50%. Patients with heart failure who have an ejection fraction that is 40% or lower are referred to as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, the patient that uh, Lawrence presented was in this category because his EF was about 14%. We also have patients who are uh, between 41 to 49% with heart failure, and this is classified as heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction because it is not normal, but it is not reduced. And then we also have a third category, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the EF is 50% or more. I'm going to talk about the management of uh, patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So not acute heart failure, not the mid-range uh, ejection fraction or the preserved ejection heart failure, but just the reduced ejection heart failure. Because that's where a lot of progress has been made in the management of this condition. Uh, these are some of the landmark trials that have been carried out over the last 30 years in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I will be touching on some of them. We start off first with uh, trials using ACE inhibitors in the 1990s, and then trials with beta blockers uh, and ARBs, and finally um, trials using uh, a compound called Evabradin in the SHIFT trial, and in 2014, uh, the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial uh, 
the unique thing about the paradigm heart failure trial was that it actually compared uh, current standard of care ACE inhibitors against a new drug, which is uh, Secubitril Valsartan. There were also trials using a uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Uh, one of it uh, that, I sh that is shown here is the emphasis heart failure trial using a compound called aplirinone. So when we talk about the management of heart failure, we can actually divide uh, the drugs that we use into drugs that improve symptoms and morbidity, and drugs that improve outcomes, uh, which is basically survival uh, prognosis. So among the drugs that are useful in heart failure to control symptoms is uh, loop diuretics. Uh, so Lawrence mentioned about the use of uh, frusimide for his patient. Uh, it re re relieves volume overload. So patients with heart failure tend to have volume overload and by giving them diuretics, you remove the excess fluid and they feel better. You also help to keep them out of hospital. So patients get hospitalized usually with acute heart failure because they have too much volume, con pulmonary congestion, ankle edema, systemic congestion, and this is relieved by giving diuretics. But diuretics has not been shown to improve prognosis. And like in Lawrence's case, he actually stopped the loop diuretics because the patient had no more congestion. So it's not necessary to be used for all patients. Digoxin is an old drug. It's a positive inotrope. Uh, it was very popular in the past because in the past, the only treatment for heart failure was diuretics and digoxin. Previously, Digoxin was a class 1 indication, but because it has not been shown to improve prognosis, just symptoms and a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, it has been moved to a class 2A. There's some concern that if you use uh, digoxin and the levels are on the high side, toxic levels, this may be associated with actually an increase in mortality. Now, these are the mainstay of treatment for heart failure re reduced ejection fraction. Because these drugs, uh, three of them, improve uh, mortality and morbidity. So patients who are treated with these drugs survive better and are less often hospitalized and also feel better. So the first class of agents is the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor is an alternative to ACE inhibitors. The second class is a beta blocker and the third class is the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. I would say that if a patient has heart failure, chronic heart failure with an ejection fraction less than 40% and is symptomatic, they should, as far as possible, be on one of these uh, three classes of agents each, meaning they should be on a minimum of three drugs. Now, if we go through uh, the studies using these drugs, firstly, a uh, very old study published in 1991 is the ACE inhibitor enalapril, which was compared with placebo in patients with heart failure re reduced ejection fraction in the soft treatment trial. And this uh, study showed a 16% reduction in all cause mortality. And there was a 26% reduction in all cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. And this was the era when we could start giving treatments that can change the outcome of patients with heart failure. The ATLAS trial looked at a different strategy, whether the dose is important or not. So this was a trial comparing low dose where lysinopril at a dose of 2.5 to 5 milligrams once daily was compared against high dose, where the aim was to give about 35 milligrams once daily. And these were in patients with heart failure with ejection fraction less than 30% and symptomatic. And over a period of about four years of follow-up, there was no difference in all cause or cardiac mortality, but there was a significant 12% risk reduction in the combined endpoint of all cause mortality and hospitalizations. So you get additional benefit with higher doses of ACE inhibitors. So as a result of this, in the guidelines, the recommended dose of ACE inhibitors to be used uh, are listed here. Uh, so patients who are started on ACE inhibitors are usually started at low doses and then if they can tolerate it, the doses should be increased up to the target dose or to the dose that the patient can tolerate. So common ACE inhibitors that we use is like enalapril, 10 to 20 milligrams twice a day will be the target dose. Perindopril, 
8 to 10 milligrams, Remipril, 10 milligrams once a day. There were many studies with uh, use of beta blockers in heart failure. Uh, three of the beta blockers have been shown to improve survival. That is uh, bisoprolol in the CBS2, carvedilol in the Copernicus trial, and metoprolol in the MERIT heart failure trial. And if you look at the, the numbers, the risk reduction is about the same, uh, 34 to 35 percent risk reduction in the risk of death. So patients who are treated with beta blockers have higher survival. The seniors trial was another trial using nebivalor in elderly patients with heart failure. And this uh, trial showed that uh, if you use uh, higher doses of uh, beta blocker, you have uh, better outcomes. And if the dose cannot be reached, then the outcomes are not as good. So uh, in the top left, you have uh, patients receiving 10 milligrams once a day, which was the target dose. And then if the patients have a lower dose, then you see that the curves become closer together and the difference in the primary endpoint becomes less significant. And in fact, if the patients are allocated nebivolol and they cannot take any nebivolol, that's zero milligram at the right lower corner, then they actually have worse outcomes than placebo. So again, suggesting that uh, if you want a better effect, we should try to target uh, to the doses that are used in the clinical trial. And in the guidelines, uh, these are the recommended target doses of beta blockers to be used. So again, for beta blockers, you should start at very low doses, uh, carvedilol at 3.125 milligrams daily, and then titrate up to about 25 milligrams twice a day. Bisoprolol at 1.25 milligrams daily, and to increase up to 10 milligrams daily. We don't have metoprolol succinate in Malaysia. Uh, and nevivolol, we use 1.25 and up to 10 milligrams daily as well. Now, the third group of drugs uh, that are important to use in patients with heart failure is the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Uh, RAILS is a very old study, also in 1999, comparing spironolactone against placebo in patients with severe heart failure. And this uh, trial showed that there was better survival in patients who received spironolactone, a reduction in mortality of about 30%. And uh, this has also been replicated in patients with less severe heart failure, mild heart failure, in the emphasis heart failure trial using a different uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist called aplirinone. And uh, this uh, trial also showed a 37% reduction in the risk of hospitalization for heart failure or death as well as a 24% reduction in the risk of death from any cause. So all these uh, three drugs, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, reduce mortality in patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we should use these three group of drugs uh, for all patients and we should titrate the drugs up to the maximum tolerated. For mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, usually there's just a standard dose. Uh, Spironolactone is about 25 to 50 milligrams. Pirinone is also about 25 to 50 milligrams once a day. So there is no target dose for apirinone or spironolactone, but there is target doses for ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. So if you want to optimize the, the management of patients with heart failure, reduce ejection fraction, we should use these drugs and push them up to the maximum tolerated or target dose. I'd like to touch a little bit about Evabredin. Uh, this is a drug which acts on the funny current in the sinus node, and it causes slowing of depolarization of the sinus node. And as a result of slowing of depolarization, the heart rate slows down. So it's a pure heart rate uh, reduction agent, and it doesn't have any other effects. In the shift trial, uh, Ivabradin reduced the primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations by 18%, which was a statistically significant reduction. But when we look at the individual endpoints, most of the benefit was actually in terms of heart failure reduction, not so much in terms of uh, mortality reduction. So Ivabradin can be considered if the patients have symptomatic heart failure and have reduced ejection fraction, uh, 
if they are already on optimal medical therapy, including ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineral receptor antagonists, and they are in sinus rhythm and the heart rate is still fast, so that is more than 70 beats per minute. And the benefit of giving them these drugs is that you reduce the combined endpoint of CV death and heart failure hospitalizations. I'd like to touch a little now on the use of uh, Secupitril Valsartan. Uh, Lawrence mentioned just now about the various systems becoming activated in heart failure, the sympathetic system, the renin angiotensin system, and the natriuretic peptide system. On this chart, I just show you two of the systems, the renin angiotensin system on the right and the natriuretic system on the left. So renin angiotensin system, when it's activated, it's actually causing adverse effects on the heart and blocking it is beneficial in patients with heart failure. The natriuretic peptide system is actually a compensatory mechanism and the natriuretic peptide actually uh, try to reverse the effects of the renin angiotensin system. So it causes vasodilatation versus vasoconstriction by the renin angiotensin system. It causes natriuresis, natriuresis diuresis, so it removes fluid and it inhibits aldosterone. So it's actually beneficial effects in patients with heart failure. But because patients with heart failure have a progressive disease, the natriuretic peptide system becomes overwhelmed. And one of the compounds in the natriuretic peptide system that, that is important is nephrilysin. This is an enzyme that breaks down uh, natriuretic peptide, BNP, and makes it uh, not active. So if you could uh, inhibit nephrilysin, you can increase the natriuretic peptide levels and therefore promote the beneficial effects of natriuretic peptide. And secubitril valsartan contains secubitril, which is a nephrilysin inhibitor, and valsartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, which blocks the renin angiotensin system. So it has uh, dual effects, both of which are beneficial in patients with heart failure. Secubitril valsartan was studied in the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial and this was not a placebo trial, it was an active control. So it was comparing secubitril valsartan at the dose of 200 mg twice again against enalapril at the dose of 10 mg twice a day. And 8,400 patients were enrolled in this trial. These patients had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and were symptomatic. And the primary endpoint was cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations. The trial was planned to go on for 34 months, but after 27 months, because there was a significant difference, it was stopped early. And uh, this is basically a uh, design of the trial. Patients were actually uh, put in through a run-in phase where they were all given enalapril, and then they were put on secubitril while satan. And if they can tolerate these drugs, only they were randomized to either secubitril while satan or enalapril. These are some of the uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So patients had to be symptomatic, had to have an EF of less than 40%. Later on in the study, they actually reduced the qualifying EF to below 35%. And they have to have an elevated uh, BMP or anti BMP levels. This is to make sure that they have significant heart failure. And they have to be stable and they should be on a beta blocker and aldosterone antagonist. If the patient has uh, renal impairment, EGFR less than 30%, they were excluded. If the potassium was elevated, they were excluded. If the blood pressure was less than 100 millimeter mercury, they were also excluded. And, and in the trial, they didn't include patients with acute heart failure. And this was the results of the trial. The primary endpoint was reduced by 20%. The primary endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations. And the numbers needed to treat was only 21 to prevent one endpoint over a period of 2.7 years. If you look at the individual endpoints, uh, Secretary Walsatan compared to Alenapril also reduced cardiovascular death by 20%, which was also statistically significant. So each of the individual endpoints were statistically reduced. Numbers needed to treat of 31. Heart failure hospitalizations was reduced by 21% with the use of secupitril uh, balsatan compared to enalapril. And all-cause mortality was also significantly reduced by 16%. How about safety events? 
So when we compared sacubitril valsartan against enalapril, there was more symptomatic hypotension uh, in the patients who received sacubitril valsartan. There was uh, uh, better pro protection of the kidney. There was less deterioration with sacubitril valsartan compared to enalapril in terms of the creatinine. And the potassium, severe potassium uh, rise was also less common in the sacubitril valsartan group. Angioedema was one of the concerns, but there was no statistically significant difference, and it was actually quite rare in both groups. Cough was, of course, more common with the enalapril group. So how would we use uh, sacubitril valsartan in chronic heart failure? So the patient has to be symptomatic, has to have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, it should be considered in patients who are already on ACE inhibitors or ARBs and are still symptomatic. If the patient is being switched from an ACE inhibitor to a sacubitril valsartan, the ACE inhibitor should be stopped for 36 hours to let the effect wash out of the system before the sacubitril valsartan is started. And if uh, you come across a patient who has heart failure and you're thinking of giving them uh, uh, sacubitril valsartan, you need to check whether they are already on an ACE inhibitor. Similarly, if you are thinking of giving the patient an ACE inhibitor, you have to check whether they could be on sacubitril valsartan because this uh, combination uh, cannot be given together. It will cause uh, severe hypotension. Because it drops the blood pressure more, so you may have to manage the problem of hypotension in patients who receive sacubitril valsartan. So we have made uh, quite a lot of progress in the last 30 years in terms of management of uh, heart failure redu reduced ejection fraction. Uh, we started off with the uh, ACE inhibitor, which uh, resulted in a 16-17% reduction in the risk of death. And then the beta blocker reduced death by another 35%. And the MRA reduces death even further. And uh, with uh, the new compound, uh, uh, the ARNI, there is even further reduction. So if you look at uh, the risk of... Uh, of death in terms of the mortality, you can get up to about 63% reduction in the risk of death if you give the patients a combination of uh, angiotensin receptor nephrolysine inhibitor, beta blocker, and MRA. So we can actually improve outcomes quite substantially if we optimize treatment for these patients. Lastly, just to uh, tell you about uh, another trial so we may be getting more drugs to treat patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This is a dapagliflozin, a SGLT2 inhibitor for the treatment of diabetes, but it was studied in heart failure. And in, the, in this DAPA-HF trial, there was actually a 26% reduction in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalizations, and urgent heart failure visits in patients who receive dapagliflozin. So that is probably another option to optimize outcomes in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Dapagliflozin has not been uh, licensed for heart failure in Malaysia, but many people are already using it, especially to treat diabetic patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And uh, in the US, the FDA actually approved dapagliflozin to treat heart failure we reduce ejection fraction to reduce CV death and heart failure hospitalizations. So I'd like to summarize by saying that we have uh, uh, available to us quite a lot of uh, drugs that can improve outcomes of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, ACE inhibitors or sacubitril valsartan. Uh, ARBs is also another alternative. Beta blockers, uh, evabradine, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and uh, we use diuretics and digoxin to control symptoms, uh, not to, to improve outcomes uh, like um, survival. And in patients who are really severe heart failure, there may be a role to use devices like uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy or ICDs to also improve uh, survival in patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. That, oh, that's better. Thank you for that very nice overview of the state of heart failure management.
Now, um, there's going to be an open panel discussion, and I really hope there'll be a lot of participation from the crowd. Now, management of heart failure is very, it's a big subject, and the, there is a lot of hospital-based uh, things that are done. And there are a lot of very major discussions. We have whole symposia on heart failure amongst cardiologists. So there's also the very important general practice aspects. And I hope this is what we can really thrash out today. And uh, we, we'd like to see how many of you are actively managing heart failure and what issues you have. So hopefully we can shed some light on your practices. Now, before we start, how many... I'm going to take this thing off, sorry. How many in the audience here um, would be happy to make a diagnosis of heart failure or would at least um, make a diagnosis and start some treatment uh, based on your diagnosis of heart failure? Can I, can I see a show of hands? So the majority of you are quite happy to make a diagnosis of heart failure and start something. Now, um, how often do you find yourselves co-managing a patient with a cardiologist, one of your patients who's got heart failure, and uh, you know, working together with the cardiologist? Do you, how many of you actually share care with the cardiologist for your heart failure patients? Can I see a show of hands again? Good. Okay, so I think we need to um, see how we can work mutually together, at which point these patients need to be referred, uh, and which point we can uh, discharge the patient back to your care. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and take, please uh, try and, uh, you know, extract as much as you can from us to help you in your practice. Maybe, uh, can I, Surin, I'll just ask, I'll ask the question. Can I find out uh, how, how accessible is the anti-pro BNP? Uh, how practical is it to order anti-pro BNP? Uh, are the patients going to object to a blood test that's $200? So let's say, uh, how many in the clinic here would do anti-pro BNP? So it's difficult, isn't it? It's the difficulty mainly that patients... If you order a test as, um, uh, that's uh, on the expensive side, is it that they, they, is it the difficulty getting the test or is it the difficulty with the patients, um, um, you know, wanting, if they, thinking that if they're paying uh, uh, something more that they'll, they'll want to, uh, say, go to a hospital and check first. Is that the thing? More, more so. But we see anti pro BNP. Um, I think, if I'm not wrong, in the uh, pathology labs, is actually a bit more expensive, because uh, of course, in our place, we do so many anti pro BNPs. We, we, it's not our hospital. We, in fact, our our lab is um, third party, but we manage to negotiate a good level because we do so many. Uh, but uh, it's just uh, uh, most of the even uh, when I was working in SGMC. Uh, we used to uh, used to emphasize it to the emergency doctors that they should do an anti pro BNP when they are not sure, because there was always this fight, especially at uh, uh, 11 p.m. at night, uh, whether the case is a COPD case or or heart failure case. I said, what's the BNP level? So, but uh, I think in um, in pri uh, family practice, maybe a BNP level is going to be uh, a very very useful test and maybe something to discuss uh, with the lab that you use as to the pricing, you know. But, um, but I can understand the challenges because even with getting medicine, uh, managing with, with uh, the hospital, I guess, uh, unless it, the patient is a panel uh, or the, the drug is given by the uh, company, but uh, the cost for sacrobitril tends to be on the higher side. Yeah, thank you. Can I just say, I mean, I hardly ever do BNP in my practice um, because I work in a hospital and I have echocardiography and uh, other tools, right? But um, for you, I always imagine this is the most wonderful thing for a GP to have at his disposal. 
because you see so many people who come in with breathlessness. And you know if there's a doubt, if it's heart failure. We know that even in patients who are asymptomatic with the ejection fraction that's down at 40%, their risk of sudden death is very significantly elevated. So there's always this fear that you might miss a patient with LV dysfunction. And I think the, this BNP test is very useful because it really rules out a lot of patients who would otherwise end up you being referred to a cardiologist. And once they come to a hospital, we are duty bound to conduct certain investigations. That's going to cost a lot of money. And I think despite what Lawrence points out, that the fact it is, as you said, 200 bucks or something in the general practice setting, I still think it is cheaper than having to send a patient who you're not too sure about into a hospital uh, where they will go through a gamut of tests uh, to be proven that it's not heart failure. So, um, David? Uh, just something. I, I, in fact, use it a lot, even though I'm in the same hospital. I use it a lot because uh, I tend to have quite a few heart failure patients, and I use it to track them, uh, track their progress. Uh, when I say a lot, those who are stable, I may do it once a year or twice a year. Uh, and more frequent for different situations, but a lot of those uh, heart failure patients are your patients forever. So um, I do track, track it and find it quite uh, useful, even though I also do the echocardiogram. Uh, be interesting to hear from David. Yeah. yeah. So um, I have been using uh, naturally peptides for a long time. Uh, Initially, I had uh, a bit of reluctance about using it because I said it's very easy to get access to echo for us cardiologists. So if you suspect a patient has heart failure, why not just uh, do an echo? Uh, and the echo is more expensive than anti-pro BMP, but if a patient has a suspected heart failure, an echo has to be done anyway along the way. Uh, anyway, when I was in IJN, uh, we started... Uh, using anti-pro BMP quite a lot. And uh, now it is kind of like a standard of care that if a patient is presenting with breathlessness, they will get an anti-pro BMP done. And uh, it's uh, uh, because it's being used so uh, regularly, I think the cost uh, in IGN is uh, actually quite low, you know, probably about 100. Uh, but uh, of course, we are not uh, that large a volume, so uh, it's a bit different in the private side. Some uh, uh, companies actually come up with a point of care. So you don't even have to send it to the lab. No? You can just uh, take the blood, put it into the machine, plug it into, a, into the point of care device, and it comes out with a report straight away. Um, so there are a few uh, areas that it may be useful. One is for diagnosis. If the patient is breathless, is it heart failure or not? Uh, sometimes uh, uh, for myself also, I get a bit surprised. The patient sounds like heart failure, breathless. Uh, and then you check the anti and it is normal. So you say, oh, uh, your initial impression the patient has heart failure was actually uh, probably incorrect. Of course, you have to take uh, these uh, readings with a bit of a uh, pinch of salt because patients who are obese will tend to have low levels. So uh, in the obese patients, they may be not high, but they may be having heart failure. And on the other hand, if the patient has renal failure, uh, because uh, the natural peptides are broken down by the kidney, in renal failure, the levels will go up. So then it may be not very useful to differentiate between whether this uh, problem is heart failure or not. So you, you need to know uh, what are the pros and cons and the potential issues with the, the test that you are using. I think the, the other use for it is for prognosis. If a patient gets admitted and you check the levels and it's very high, then it's likely that the patient has more severe heart failure and therefore poor outcome. Lawrence uh, said that his patient was 3008. The, uh, the values we can get in the lab uh, using the analyzer can go up to 35,000. So I have seen patients where the reading is more than 35,000. So meaning that it's beyond what the machine can actually measure. And usually these are the patients who don't do so well. Uh, and then we can also use it to assess response to treatment, like what Lawrence has mentioned. His, his patient's BNP level from 3,008 dropped to 300. There's a tenfold reduction. Uh, 
So that, that tells me that probably the patient is doing quite well and responding quite well to therapy. In fact, uh, some uh, people are actually looking and have studied whether you can use this to guide therapy. So uh, generally, uh, most people feel that if you can bring the level, for example, anti pro below 1,000, the patients have better outcomes compared to if it is still elevated despite therapy. Uh, and then another area sometimes is uh, in patients with heart failure, they come to you and they say they're very breathless, they're not well. Then you check the anti pro and you find that it's actually quite low. So sometimes the patient's uh, symptoms might be due to other things than heart failure. And on the other hand, we have also seen patients who we think are not doing well, but the patient comes and says, I'm okay, I can walk around, I'm not breathless. Then you check the anti pro and you find that it's in the thousands. So the patient actually is really not doing well. So sometimes you help to correlate the symptoms versus what is happening to the patient. So there are actually quite a number of users of this. Can I ask David and Lauren, since you guys use this a lot, on a you know routine basis, do you in any way let this affect your decision to increase dosages to optimal levels? I think that's important. Yeah. I might not titrate up if the patient's anti pro MP is normal. Uh. You might not titrate up. Yep. So this this is an important issue because all these trials don't talk about uh, using pro uh, anti pro and B, BNP to titrate. Uh, your doses, and we're all told to push to the max for all the drugs. Two questions. Um, do you think this applies to... Sorry. Was that a question? <laughs> okay. Uh, two questions. One, do you think these targets that we are, ought, we, are, we are advised to achieve are applicable in our Asian populations? Uh, number one. Can somebody just bring the microphone around, uh, Melody? The, yeah, just some, uh, you know. Yeah. Sorry, what was it? So the question is, um, if David is prepared to, you know, not be rigidly held to the, the targets that we are supposed to achieve with maximum dosages, which of course are so expensive very often, and I just wonder whether... The, Asian populations uh, need to achieve the same kind of targets, whether there's any data that we can take it easy, maybe with the help of BNP, etc. So I think uh, the targets are there for a purpose, is to tell us what is the dose we should aim for. Uh, but to me, I think it is more important to make sure that they are on the three main classes of agents, uh, and then you up titrate. Uh, rather than you try to increase asymptomatics to maximum and you cannot give beta blocker or MRA because you are pushing just one drug up. Uh, so a lot of the times, uh, it is very difficult to reach the target, either because the blood pressure is low or the patient's kidney function is not good or their heart rate is getting slow. So if uh, we can't, then we have to accept that this is the maximum we can reach. But generally, if the patients can tolerate the target dose, I think they do better. Yes, any questions from the floor? Yes, gentleman in blue. Uh, a US professor who was also doing a lot of research on heart failure said that the way heart failure is being treated is mainly symptomatic. You're not treating the cause. So, scientists in stem cells uh, therapy has gone into that line and Professor Riley from Oxford University who came here to give a talk and he showed that IPS stem cells will be quite helpful. In fact, if you have an ejection fraction of 40 or less than 40, after stem cell therapy for one month, it probably increased by 12. And if you go for four months, you go up by 22. That's not too bad, you know. I went to Kyoto Stem Cells Center, and you were doing it as well. But I just want to ask you, why are mural cells and endothelial cells so essential to stem cells therapy in a heart, injection into the heart? 
I think uh, a lot of these uh, stem cell uh, uh, studies are anecdotal. They are not really uh, uh, large enough to be able to answer the question whether it is helpful or not. So um, in the guidelines, there is no mention of stem cell therapy for the treatment of heart failure. Um, and the, the cause of heart failure would depend upon uh, a few things. Uh, I think coronary artery disease is one. So the treatment for that will be revascularization. Uh, if it's a uh, heart muscle disease, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, then uh, at this point in time, there is no definitive treatment for that. Stem cell therapy is not a uh, accepted uh, standard therapy for the management of patients with heart failure. Though it sounds uh, attractive, you're trying to replace the cell, the myocardium, uh, to see whether it can help the heart to pump better. But there is no data that I'm aware of that it works uh, for sure. I do agree with you because very few stem cells uh, what are treatment are being implicated. Uh, being what's uh, implemented, but in this year, I think they are going to start in Seattle. Okay, I go to the next question about the paradigm. Do you think it's fair to compare Entresto with Enalapril, two drugs with one drug? And the other thing is, using sub subcutaneous, can you replace it with a diuretic because it's basically a diuretic with vasodilatation. Uh, action as well. Then the other thing, you have to be careful when you analyze a paper like Paradigm. They are using relative risk, you know, which tends to magnify the risks. Number two, the run-in effects. If you ask any medical statistician, the run-in type of a study is to make the drug look more safe. One leading medical statistician says that if you let 1,000 people try for a few weeks, let's say 300 of them cannot take because of vomiting and all that, and then you take 700, actually you are deleting the 300 people who would have side effects uh, in the trial. That's one of the way the pharma try to produce a result that shows that their drug is safe and with very little side effects. Uh, so, uh, you, when you ask whether it's fair or not, I think, of course, uh, when you do a study, uh, if you say uh, you do an ACE inhibitor against placebo, you're, you're trying to see whether the drug works against uh, something in a controlled setting. Um, it is true, true that when you give uh, sacrificial valsatan, you're giving two drugs versus one. Because you want to test the theory, is two drugs better than one? And the uh, data suggests that the use of Sacubitril on top of Vosotan is better than Enalapril. I think it's fairer if you use Enalapril plus Abacutil. You know? Because um, you there, there is an issue with the use of uh, ACE inhibitors with a nephrilysine inhibitor. Uh, in the earlier trial called the Overture, they used Omapratrilat which actually is an ACE inhibitor with a nephrilysine inhibitor, and they found that this combination was associated with higher risk of angioedema. So if, if you really want to say fair or not, you should probably compare uh, Sacrificial Valsatan against Valsatan. But Valsatan is not the standard of care for heart failure reduced ejection fraction. ACE inhibitors is a standard of care. So they wanted to compare the standard of care versus a new treatment, which is actually a combination of two, two drugs. But I noticed in your slide that you didn't include ARV as one of the preferred drugs. Uh, I didn't include ARV because of lack of time, but uh, in, the, in the overview of the, uh, of the landmark trials, actually there has been three ARV uh, that have been studied in heart failure, Losatan, Valsatan, and Candisatan. And... Uh, they have uh, studied in a number of settings, but I think basically the conclusion is that uh, ARBs are not better than ACE inhibitor because when they compare ARB against ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitors seem to be the same or better. 
uh, combination of A symptom and ARB is is uh, has some benefit, but has got a lot of potential effects. So many people don't use it anymore. So the only role for ARBs is in patients who are ACE inhibitor intolerant. And we open up the floor to anybody else with questions. Uh, thank yes, you. over there, number 23. Uh, thank you, Tatuk David. You are right to say that the physical meeting like this is more interesting. I have listened to you, virtual meeting. It was chaired by Jayamala. Later on, I forgot about all this virtual meeting. To make it uh, easier for you, we illustrate with uh, Lauren's case. At the end of his case, the ejection fraction was still around 30, uh, in the region of 35. So can we make the patient better? You mentioned Ivabradin, you mentioned SGLT2, the, the DAPA heart failure trial. Now the Emperor, Emperor trial is a positive trial and we are waiting for the details at the end of this month from the ESC. There's a new kid on the block called Very Sequat. And then when it was announced at a virtual meeting from the US, when I asked this uh, question in this virtual meeting, the, the coordinator never even mentioned my, my, my question. So I'm sure you're aware of Very Sequat working through the cyclic GFP and maybe also good for pulmonary hypertension. I think the, you're talking about the Victoria trial, uh, where Siguat uh, seems to be very useful in the treatment of chronic heart failure as well. Uh, the result of the trial was positive. So that, that is probably another option in terms of uh, treatment of heart failure. So it looks like you'll be en ending up with more and more additional drugs for patients with heart failure. Then it becomes an issue of whether the patients can tolerate this and all these new drugs are also quite costly. So the cost will become an, another issue as well. So I, I don't know. I think we probably will give it to the patients who are really very bad. Uh, like in Lauren's case, I think if the patient is doing quite well, not much symptoms, anti is good, probably there's no, no real need to add on the drugs. You see, in the trials where they added on drugs, they always had this uh, inclusion that the patient had to have symptomatic heart failure. So if they are in functional class one, not much symptoms, they actually wouldn't qualify for including into the trials. So you may need, not need to add up if the patients are doing quite well. Uh, but I think there is another option which may come into the guidelines in the future. With the Verisigwad, there's no mortality benefit. It's just hospital readmissions for heart failure. Yeah. Um, can I ask Lawrence, uh, relating to your patient, Lawrence, you, um, you went spironolactone as your first drug by the look of it. Any reason for that? <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to be like that. I still, uh, it's a cost, cost issue. I hardly use epilarinone. So uh, I think there's data that spironolactone does show a um, mortality benefit as well. So I, I tend to still use uh, spironolactone. Um, just, uh, it's just the way uh, the practice is. But um, I, I give you another example, and it's related to a couple of things that were mentioned. Uh, so that is all data, and sometimes we feel that data is a bit further away. Can, it's not something we see. But just two things. One, I've seen a case where a person was given stem cell during bypass surgery and he actually succumbed, this one, because he was given the idea that he would have bypassed and given uh, uh, stem cell. So that was one experience of mine. I had another patient who was an English uh, person who, when I told him he had heart failure, he said he would go for stem cell. He went, he told me, he, he went to Oxford. So I don't know whether it's the same person. And the, the professor there told him that he is not qualified to enter into whatever trial or program it was. He, in fact, took himself to Europe and he had stem cell and he also did not do well. So there, there's data. There's not enough of data to say stem cell does well. And I also personally saw two patients who decided to go for stem cell, which didn't show much uh, effect. Then there's another thing is about the <laughs> all, all my cost savings. There was one a patient I put on uh, uh, Sacubitro who um, who did very well, 
whose uh, LV function went to normal. And I kind of made an assumption about that I needed to save costs. And I said, why don't we go back to the ARB? And uh, she went on to the ARB based on my advice. And then within a month or so, she came back and said, I want to take back the combination. So there is the data and there is also day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day experience that uh, I think a lot of us see is that there, is, there seems to be a clear uh, an advantage when you go on to this combination of uh, uh, ARNI uh, with, uh, with uh, ARB. So there seems to be an effect as well. I think that's a good learning point, Lawrence's case. We've all seen phenomenal results with AR Anis, um, and you know patients who have been bed bound with severe congestive heart failure can climb three or four flights of stairs. They're no longer edematous. It is a miraculous drug in in my lifetime to see a heart failure drug do something like this. But don't be lulled into thinking these patients are actually better. Because whenever you stop these drugs, the data even shows they regress back to their original heart failure state in, most, in, in a large component of them, especially if there's no reversible element that has been addressed. And in fact, once they regress, it is even more difficult to get them back to their previous level of health. So there's a category called recovered LV function, patients with EF between 40 to 50. Uh, if you've taken them past this point, don't um, risk stopping their medication uh, once they've responded. I can remember the exact instances where I've done that. There were several, I, had, I remember several patients who are chemo patients who had uh, Herceptin. And after treatment with uh, not uh, ARNI, they were with ARB, and their chemo had stopped and they had improved. So the, I'm sure you encounter this, the patient will say, must I continue, everything's all right. So I've stopped before. And those are chemo patients, and they re, uh, recur. So, and then there are the patients who stop their own medicines, and they recur. So, from from my own uh, clinical practice, and not even based on lots of data or whatever, you, I would be very, pro I, I hardly would ever agree anymore to stopping medicines because I've seen people relapse uh, a bit too often. Another question for Lawrence. Uh, you opted to do a, you, in your plan uh, for the patient's management, you put CTA when the patient presented with heart failure. Is that something you normally consider as your investigation of choice for a heart failure? I mean, patient? if it is, uh, if, when you see somebody with a dilated cardiomyopathy, especially in a male 40 something, you have to exclude, uh, in fact, I would almost all, always exclude coronary artery disease. So uh, I wanted to initially just have an idea. He had no symptoms of chest discomfort. Uh, although you look at the echo now and the ECG, it looks very clearly it's ischemic. But uh, I want, uh, he, he was quite unwell. His ejection fraction was 13% and I was a bit reluctant to go in and uh, have somebody have a big event on the table. So, uh, but yes, all, all, all my dilated cardiomyopathies, I would generally study their coronaries. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that patients who have poor LV function generally are not good candidates for CT angiography because, number one, the contrast can, the load of the contrast could tip them into a, a more dangerous state. Secondly, if they've got um, impaired LV function and renal impairment, the contrast can be harmful. And thirdly, because of their heart rates being higher than normal, it is difficult to get good images. So generally, if the patient really is in heart failure with significant LV impairment, uh, we tend not to use CT because of its uh, diagnostic problems and the risk and the potential of nephrotoxicity as well. Any other questions from the floor? Maybe I'd just like to address the, one of the questions about the run-in phase huh, of the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial. Um, I, I was one of the investigators. So Malaysia was one of the sites for the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial. There were a few sites in Malaysia. And uh, I also voiced at the investigators meeting, why do you want to have a run-in phase? Because uh, if you have a run-in phase, some patients cannot tolerate the drugs. Then you will 
tend to exclude them. And then you, it may not be applicable to everybody in the trial. Uh, and because of that, when we recruit, recruited patients, we were actually looking for patients who were on high doses of ACE inhibitors or ARBs. And patients who were on low doses of ACE inhibitors or ARBs, we didn't even bother to include them because we thought that uh, they would not be able to tolerate the run-in phase. In, in the whole trial, about 10% of patients were finally excluded because they couldn't go through the run-in phase. But 90% of the patients reached it. So one of the uh, reasons for that was actually it was uh, sort of, I think, requested by the FDA in the trial design to have this uh, run-in phase because they want to make sure that uh, the standard of care which is analapril, 10 mg BD, could be tolerated by most of the patients. Okay. Uh, when you talk about stem cells, you have to come from a good center with stem cells. There are people in Kuala Lumpur who are giving stem cells also, you know, and they are giving mesenchymal stem cells. You, get, can, get, you can get cancer from mesenchymal stem cells and other what are, uh, morbidities. You must go to a place which has excellent IPSC. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is... Is there such a place in Kuala Lumpur? Or? Yeah, I know. They are charging $30,000, $40,000. Right. I don't want to mention the name of the cardiologist who do it also. Of course, you'll know. Where was I? Okay. <laughs> Why do you want to use Entrasto, a combination of two? Why don't you use Sacubitril alone without Val Valsatan? The one, I'm not really sure, but I, I guess if the drug is available, then it may be possible to use Segubitril with an, another uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, maybe uh, Candisatan or Losatan. No? Because, it is you know, the, sorry, can I just... Uh, the desired effect of using neprilysin alone, a neprilysin inhibitor alone, would be like Nazirotide, I guess. Nazirotide is pure... Um, natriuretic peptide, which is used in acute heart failure, but does not appear to have any prognostic benefit uh, for the patient. It is good for acute uh, uh, volume uh, decrease, and they found that beyond that, it's only uh, of little value. So I guess that would be the equivalent of neprilysin inhibition is to have. So you, you also mentioned about why not use diuretic instead of secubitril. So I think the mechanism of action is probably different from diuretic alone, you know, because besides the uh, natriuretic effects, diuretic effects, it also has inhibition of aldosterone, uh, it has vasodilatin effects. Same thing, same thing as SGLT2. How SGLT2 works in heart failure is probably not just the diuretic effects. There are other benefits, you know. So uh, at this point in time, I think the mechanism of how it works is still not so clear, but we don't think it's just diuretic alone. In line with my question to all of you earlier about working together with a cardiologist, managing heart failure patients in the clinical a GP practice setting, maybe David, you could uh, tell the GPs or uh, how we could work symbiotically, like patients are discharged from you, your care. How can the G what things can the GPs do uh, to make sure the patients remain as well as possible uh, to reduce hospital readmissions? Well, I think uh, usually uh, we have to educate the patient. So that part is quite important so that they will be compliant. And among the things that uh, they need to be compliant about is the fluid and salt restriction. Uh, and then uh, we usually encourage the patients to take their weight daily so these are things which uh, can be applicable for all of us to, uh, to the patients. And, uh, and then we need to monitor the patients uh, for side effects from the treatment that we give. So monitoring can be the blood pressure, whether there are any symptoms due to postural dizziness or bradycardia, and also monitoring of the, of the kidney function and electrolytes. So those will be quite standard things. And, and then the other thing will be up titration of uh, therapies. Uh, I think that um, from my experience, uh, um, usually if the patient gets admitted in the hospital, 
and after their discharge, they will probably still come to see the cardiologist first until they come to a phase where they are stable and where there is not much change in the medication. And that, that will be the time when uh, the patient and uh, ourselves would feel comfortable to then pass on the care to the GP. And in those instances, then usually the instructions would be, this would be the medications that we have put the patient on. Uh, these are the medications that you may want to change, up titrate, down titrate. And uh, this will be the circumstances where you may want to send the patients back to us. So if the patients are not doing well, if you see the patients having symptoms, developing heart failure again, or developing hypotension, worsening renal function, uh, then it may be time for a review. In, in European uh, countries, I've read of how GPs are able to, instead of doing, I mean, before Pro-BNP came along, the six-minute walk test, which is a crude, sounds like a crude test, but gives a lot of very useful information. From your point of view, have you had any experience with this? And do you think it's something that uh, our general practice community can use to assess or uh, follow up patients with heart failure? Um, I think it's uh, not that easy to do, uh, the six minute walk test. Uh, recommendation to do it is that you have to have a corridor that is 30 meters long uh, without any obstruction. Uh, and then you tell the patient to walk back and forth along the corridor and then you measure the distance that they cover over a period of six minutes. So firstly, uh, the time needed to do the test, you know, it's going to be more than six minutes because you have to give the instruction, you have to wait for the patient to recover. So uh, I personally don't do the six minute walk test. Uh, in, in IJN, uh, we delegate it to the physiotherapist. In CVSKL, we ask our physiotherapists, but I think they are not very familiar with doing it. So we were planning to do it together, but in the end, I decided uh, for practical purposes, use the BNP la, rather than the six minute walk. Because that, it, that depends also a bit on the patient's uh, motivation to walk. It depends on whether the patient got leg problems. Uh, so there are quite a number of uh, factors. But if you have the same patient, the same situation, you can use it as a comparison. If the patient is getting better, then the distance walk will get higher. And if the patient is deteriorating, then the distance walk will drop. Uh, a more established role of the six-minute walk test actually is in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, Any questions from the floor? Yes, the number 23 again. Uh, in HEF-REF, we know mineral corticoid is important. So to digress a bit, in the hef path, the, the top CAT study shows that the, the, the spinal lactone they used was positive in U.S., but then they couldn't replicate it in, an, in other countries. What, what are your thoughts that in future we will get one neurocorticoid which will be useful for heart path? So for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there aren't any uh, studies that show that there is a definite improvement in outcomes. Most of the studies are kind of like borderline and all that. Uh, that there, there could be many reasons for this. Uh, like in the top cat, they believe that the population of pa patients recruited were different in different countries. So that could explain why there was this difference. Because I think in the Eastern Europe, the mortality rates and uh, event rates were very low. Uh, whereas in the uh, Western Europe, America, the event rates were higher. And in, in the subgroup in those countries with higher event rates, there was actually a difference but the overall trial was negative. Um, so for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you could use the data from many trials to say there is possibly, possibility of minor benefit, maybe reduction in symptoms, reduction in hospitalizations, and uh, apply it to the particular patient that you are managing. So for myself, I sometimes use ACE inhibitors, sometimes I use ARBs, sometimes I use beta blockers. I, I also use a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. I use diuretics. But for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, up to this point, there isn't any data to show that uh, there is a therapy that definitely works. Uh, 
So in the guidelines, the recommendation is manage the comorbidities of the patients and uh, relieve symptoms by diuretics. So that, that is basically uh, the approach at this point in time. Um, going back to the uh, MRA com value in the heart failure management, we, you know, neprilysin inhibitors there, beta blockers, we know we titrate it, we get a heart rate of about 50 to 60 or 70, we've already done what we need, we can do. Now, would you, of course, uh, given the audience here and the setting, would, how, how much a component is the MRA to the heart failure resolution compared to neprilysin? So in the interest of economy, could we push up the spinolactone to a maximum before we uh, push up the MR, uh, ARNI? Um, you are already putting the patient on the uh, RNE, is it? Or well, I mean, of course, ARNEs are the same price across the board, right? Um, but how how much a component is the MRA uh, in a management armamentarium, given that data is pre ani in this day and age with ani around? So, how you know how aggressive will you be with spinal electron? Because I don't, I only go in ma I, maximum twenty five BD. And I don't go higher, though the studies have gone even higher. So what is your view on that? It's a cheap drug. I think spironolactone, 25 to 50 milligrams daily is adequate for most patients. Unless the patient has a lot of fluid retention, then you are increasing the dose to treat the, for diuresis. diuresis. But if you're talking about for prognosis, I think 25 to 50 milligrams is probably adequate. So there's usually no need to push it up. Whereas the data with the uh, Sagripuju Walsatan is that the target dose that was used is 200 twice a day. So that will be the dose that you should aim for in patients who are on the uh, RD. Are there any concerns about long term Sagripuju? Are you aware? Uh, no. Any more questions from the floor? How much time do we have? Maybe I just uh, add that the uh, sacrificial water system was also studied in the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, which is the Paragon heart failure trial. And uh, the primary endpoint was. Uh, not statistically significant, even though there was a trend uh, towards a benefit. Um, and uh, when you look at the subgroup of pa patients in the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, there seem to be certain subgroups that benefited from the use of uh, sacrificial valsatan. The Paragon trial compared sacrificial valsatan against valsatan uh, in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, so, Maybe in certain uh, patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, sacrificial valsatan can be also be used. Um, out of interest to my colleagues here, a patients refer to you with the question mark, is this heart failure? What's the common, most common presenting symptom they come with with the question mark referred for suspected heart failure? Breathlessness? Breathlessness and ankle swelling, perhaps? For me, it appears to be ankle, ankle swelling more often than not. And what is the most common reason the patient has ankle swelling? Calcium antagonist. Calcium antagonist. So please be warned out there. Amlodipine is a notorious ankle edema causer. And uh, very often we get referred patients uh, with ankle edema with suspected question mark heart failure. Again, this is where a BNP would would sort sort out the issue yeah could you also just quickly uh, mention false elevations of bnp in case all these gps today are going to go out there and start ordering bnp to reduce unnecessary referrals to cvskl <laughs> uh, what are the false positives or falsely elevated bnps we need to you mentioned uh, uh, obesity will give you a falsely low high we know failure Renal failure? Yeah. If you have a 
structural heart disease, uh, you will get elevated uh, nitritic peptide. For example, if the patient has uh, atrial fibrillation, they have valvular heart disease, if they have pulmonary hypertension, if they have pulmonary embolism, uh, so they, all these are because there is stresses on the myocardium, so that, that will cause it to rise. So they are actually probably appropriate. You know? uh, the reason why in renal failure it rises, I guess two possibilities. One is that because of the breakdown being uh, reduced or excretion being reduced because of the kidney impairment. But I just wonder whether in some of these patients with elevation of the antiprobiotic and renal failure, they may actually have fluid overload as well. So they, they, it could also be a reflection of increased stretch on the heart. Yep. Yes, number 23. Sorry, I don't know your name. I, uh, uh, Dr. David, since you mentioned the Paragon data, how do you tease out that group of patients who will benefit from Entresto? Uh, those people with, with obesity, those people who fall into a range of ejection fraction? So it's, it, it will look uh, from the subgroup analysis that the patients on the lower side of the ejection fraction tend to have uh, uh, better outcomes with uh, circuitry while satan. And women apparently also seem to have a better response. Uh, um, I think uh, you could uh, apply some of this and say that if your patient happens to fulfill those type of criteria, then that could be a way in which you may want to use it for that particular group. But again, this is based on uh, individual. So it's not something that is uh, going to be recommended as a standard therapy but it could be an option because in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we don't actually have any therapies that uh, help patients. So it's kind of like uh, if you are scraping the barrel, not sure what else to do, patient is very symptomatic, that you may want to try these different options. Okay, I've been hand given a signal from the back to wrap up the, the session today. Um, I'd like to thank um, my two Colleagues here, Dr. Lawrence Chan and Dr. David Chu. I'd like to thank Novartis and Doc Kuti for hosting this session. I hope you found it useful. Uh, please feel free to grill us over the next few minutes before we leave. Uh, and uh, please enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Duray Singham. I would like to again thank Dr. David and Dr. Lawrence for the very thorough and in-depth discussion. It was indeed a very educational and fruitful session. With this, we've come to the end of the CV Scale Summit. And on behalf of Novartis, I would like to thank everyone for attending. And we look forward to seeing you again at our next session. And just a reminder to complete the feedback form via the QR code and do provide the IC details and emails for the e-certificate. And also refreshments are again available outside, so please go ahead and grab some. And thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you for, on our next session. Thank you. <laughs>